Everyone, it's so wonderful to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm glad to be back with you as I was not able to do this last week because I was at a conference in Phoenix, but I'm really glad that we we're able to be back together tonight. And tonight we're going to be starting a new study. We're going to be looking at <clears throat> uh, St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthians. And this is a really great letter. We're going to talk more about that in a moment, but let's go ahead and start off uh, with a prayer and then we'll kind of get into this text from there. But please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you that you brought us together here tonight to be able to study your word, to grow in our faith in you and our love for you. And God, we pray that we would hear these words, that we'd be strengthened in our faith through these words, and that we would know your love for us. God, where there is division in your church throughout the world, but even here at Our Savior, pray that you would heal it and that we would live in unity with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, last thing before we begin our study tonight, I just want to let you know if you have any uh, thoughts, comments, questions, please do reach out to me. I'll do my best to answer them first thing next week. And I also want to encourage you to just go ahead and uh, share this video with other people. Invite them to come and join you as we grow in our faith together through the reading of God's Word. Uh, we're going to be starting off looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 tonight. And as we do that, I think it's important for us to understand a little bit about what is going on in Paul's ministry. So this is being written about early 50 AD. So one of Paul's first letters uh, when it comes to chronology. It's one of the first letters that Paul writes. And there are some really important things about that. Uh, one is that Paul very clearly in this letter articulates the gospel over and over again. And this just shows that, that very quickly after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the church was routinely and regularly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That that all people were sinners, that they were in need of God's grace, and that it is only through the cross of Christ that people receive redemption. So this really drives home the point, this has been the message of the church ever since the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, the letter that Paul was writing to the church in Corinth is very interesting. It's a letter where there, he's dealing with a lot of issues. There are a lot of issues in this church. There are issues of disunity, of people who are arguing with one another over who is the the real leader of the church, uh, whether it be Paul or Apollos or Cephas. We're going to actually see that here in the first chapter uh, from Corinthians chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians today. But there's also issues with a lot of sexual immorality, a lot of sexual immorality that's going on in this church. There is a lot of uh, issues when it comes to communion and, and just, like I said, living in unity with one another as the church. And so this is a letter where there's a lot of correction from Paul. And yet we still see here, that Paul really does love this church, he does love these people, and uh, uh, and he really is writing this letter to, to deal with those issues, to correct those issues, but he's doing it in love, because he does love these people. Now, for us to understand the, the, the area of Corinth, Corinth at this time was a very affluent area, there was a lot of wealth, it was a, a, a place where there were many different cultures all kind of combining and coming together, there was a lot of idolatry that was present. There was a lot of religious mingling, so uh, syncretism where you're taking this part of the religion and this part of religion and you're bringing them together and you're, you're kind of almost making a new thing. So this is the kind of world that the people who Paul is writing this letter to are living in. And uh, um, it really is kind of like a modern day metropolis that we would live in today as well. I mean, you go to any kind of major metropolis, it's the same kind of thing. There's a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of different cultures. There's a lot of different gods. There's a lot of idolatry in general. And, and, and a lot of times you see a lot of mixing of faiths and everything as well. That is, that is what's going on here in the church in Corinth. And that is what the people who Paul is writing to are dealing with. And that, I think, as we go into this text today, will maybe help us understand uh, some of these issues that Paul is going to be trying to address and deal with as he, uh, as he teaches and preaches to the church in, Cor in Corinth. Um, so that's kind of the background for us. Let's go ahead and just jump into it. We're going to be looking at chapter 1, through verses 1 through 25 today. We're not going to get all the way through chapter 1 today. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 25. Let's go ahead and start just reading this, this opening greeting. This is what St. Paul writes. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So St. Paul, uh, whenever he writes a letter, he introduces, you know, this is who I am, I'm Paul, you know who I am, but this, I'm writing to you. 
Uh, here we also see this kind of interesting greeting where he says, uh, Paul, called by the will of God, being an apostle of Christ Jesus. So, yeah, call, uh, Paul is actually called by God. We know that story of the road to Damascus where Jesus appears to him and says, Paul, you're going to be an apostle. But uh, he also mentions here Sosthenes. Sosthenes is uh, somebody who appears in the Bible in Acts chapter 18, verse 17. Uh, when Paul is under trial in Jerusalem, Sosthenes has been traveling with him. And Sosthenes is actually attacked uh, when Paul is under trial. So this guy is uh, a guy is persecuted for following Christ and for working with Paul. He's not following Paul, he's working with Paul. And how is he working with Paul? Very specifically here, uh, he is writing this letter down. So Paul is dictating this letter. He is not writing it with his own hand. He's dictating this letter. Sosthenes is the amuescence, or whatever, uh, the, the person who is writing, uh, taking the dictation down. But then St. Paul in chapter verse 2 says, To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their lords and their lord and ours. And this is a really awesome start to this letter. And this is something that I think, uh, honestly, I'd never really noticed before until I was uh, listening actually to a podcast about this text. And uh, uh, I love what this, what the podcaster here said, uh, you know, Paul is going to be giving a lot of correction. This is a church that's really struggling, a church that's really actually not, they're not living like, they should be living. They're, they're not. Li they don't look very sanctified. Let's just put it that way. They don't look very sanctified. They don't look very holy in how they're living. But how does Paul start this letter? To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Paul starts this letter off by reminding them that they are sanctified. They may not look like it in the moment. They may not be following Christ the way they should. Certainly, they they were not. But they are sanctified, and this is an important thing for us to remember. It'd be great. It'd be great if all the time, if all the time we followed Christ and it looked like we were following Christ. It'd be great if we did. That should be the case. The reality is, is it's not. And, and the reality of why it's not is because we're all sinners, and because we're all sinners, we fall short of the glory of God. And, and sometimes we fall into these ruts of sin where we just keep going down, going down, and going down this road. That's what the Corinthians were doing. But it doesn't change the fact that we are, we, we belong to Christ. And in him we are justified, but also in him we are being sanctified. And so I love how St. Paul starts this letter. He's, he's going to be really be correcting a lot of issues, but he starts this letter off by saying, reminding them that you are sanctified in Christ Jesus. And you are saints because of Christ Jesus. And so before he goes into anything, he anchors their identity in Christ, because he's going to be dealing with a lot of problems and really calling them out on, on some of their issues. But he's reminding them about all things that they are in Christ, and that is where their hope is found. And uh, um, and we need to do that. I mean, there's a lot of times in our life as Christians that we deal with sin in our own lives and that we're dealing with sin with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church as well. Uh, we actually should correct that sin. Uh, we, we don't want our brothers and sisters in Christ to continue going down the road of sinfulness but it needs to always be anchored in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. St. Paul is not afraid to call out this church. He's not afraid to correct them in their sinfulness. He's not afraid to say that they are behaving poorly, but he, he first reminds them of, yeah, you may not be doing what you should be doing, but you are Christ. You belong to him. And, and, and that's a really important thing for us to remember, even as we struggle in our faith, that we are called by Christ. We are rooted and anchored in him. And then verse three, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. God brings grace, God brings peace, and he is ours because of what he has done for us. Okay, so that's the opening. And then we get into verses uh, before he really gets into any of the issues, and he jumps into the issues pretty quickly, beginning in verse 10. Before he does that, he just, once again, really, really hammers home this point of being rooted in the hope of Christ Jesus. And he does that in verses 4 through 9, when he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, I, once again, he just drives home this point of where you are anchored. Yes, you are going to be 
We're going to be dealing with a lot of sin, a lot of struggle you're going with here. But where are you anchored? And he talks, I, he, he reminds me of that. As he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. Thanks, God, for the grace they have received. Even if their behavior is not matching that grace in the moment, that grace is still theirs. And he he's, once again, he's not holding this out as a carrot. He is reminding them and anchoring them in this. Um, verse 8, when he talks about, uh, so that you are not, verse 7 and 8, when he says, so that you are not lacking any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, I know I've, I'm going to say this probably the 10th time already. He is going to be dealing with a lot of sin and a lot of difficulty and a lot of really failure by the church here. But what does he say there in verse 8? He will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are guiltless because of the work of Christ for them and how Christ sustains them. And this is actually really an amazing thing uh, that, that Paul writes this, because these people are not living out their faith well, but he roots them in the hope that they have in Christ and anchors them back in the grace that they have been given. That's what he's doing in these four to nine verses. He's anchoring them in the hope and the life and the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ as he gets ready to begin to really address their issues. And I said this before that, you know, he's going to rip into them. No, he's not really ripping into them. That's not the purpose of this. He's, he's wanting to remind them of who they are in Christ and to correct their really falling short. So that's what we see in those verse nine verses. Paul's introduction, Paul's greeting, and Paul's reminder uh, of, of, uh, of who they are in Christ. And now this last thing as well, uh, God is faithful. Verse nine, God is faithful. God is faithful. These people are not acting, the church in Corinth by and large is not acting faithfully. And that's a reminder, people are not faithful. People are not faithful. The church is not faithful. But here we are reminded as well, once again, God is. God is faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. Okay, so that leads us then into this first issue that St. Paul is going to be addressing, that the church in Corinth is really, really struggling with. And this thing they're struggling with is divisions in the church. And this is what he writes, verses 10 through 17. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Or I follow, uh, Christ, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I did not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So there's a lot here. But uh, let's, let's go and start with the simplest and most unimportant thing that I'm sure... Some of you at least have to be thinking, uh, and this is the most unimportant thing in here, but I just want to address this because it is unimportant, but it's still something I'm guessing some of you are wondering. Who are Chloe's people? Chloe's people, we don't know 100% certain, but that Chloe was a Christian, and Chloe's people, uh, a Christian, most people believe she was a merchant, and so these are probably Christian travelers pursuing business on Chloe's behalf, and they're in Corinth, and they, see, they, they go to meet with the church, and they see what's going on there, and they come back to Paul, and they say, this is not good what's going on. This is not good. This is what's going on in the church. What's going on in the church there is that uh, some people are saying they follow Paul, some are saying they follow Cephas, some say they're following Apollos, and some say they're following Christ. So that's Chloe's people, and they're the ones who report this to Paul, who's not in Corinth at the time. And this is a big problem. Uh, and it's, it's a problem because uh, it's not supposed to be a competition. The answer should have been from every single person here, we're following Christ. But instead there were clearly some who were saying we follow Paul, we follow Apollos, we follow Cephas. And some who were saying we follow Christ. What Paul is saying here is, uh, and I love what Paul, how Paul responds to this, actually. Uh, and he says, is Christ, in verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So he doesn't even use Apollos or Cephas here, but he just says, how can this be divided? How could you argue whether you're following Paulus or Cephas or 
Paul or Christ. I didn't die for you. I didn't baptize. I mean, I, Paul did baptize a few people, even names are here, but you weren't baptized in my name. I may have baptized these people, but they were baptized in Christ's name. I didn't do proclaim the gospel, but even the proclamation of the gospel wasn't me. It was the gospel is, belongs to Christ, and the proclamation of the gospel is by the Spirit. And and any work that has been done in you has not been the work of Paul. It's been the work of of Christ. And and with that as well, even though he doesn't specifically say that about Apollos or Cephas, he makes it very clear that there, that's that's the implications that. That's the same thing. Apollos didn't save you. Apollos didn't die for you. Cephas didn't die for you. And also the idea behind this is that Paul's getting at is that Apollos and Cephas would never have made the claim they did. Uh, now, I, Cephas is Peter, okay? P uh, Peter, the, 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 the apostle, the disciple of Jesus. Apollos is just, a, 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 we don't know much about Apollos except that he was a faithful man of God and he was a dynamic preacher. Uh, Paul may not have actually been that great of a preacher. We get the impression that Paul's he's a great writer, a great writer, an incredible intellect. But he may not have been that great of a preacher. Apollos was uh, apparently just a, a dynamic, phenomenal presenter of the gospel. And all three of these people had at one point or another interacted with the Corinthian church. And so people were arguing over who was right, Paul or Cephas or Apollos. And Paul's point is none of these things, no, we, don't ma we don't matter. Christ matters, and the message of the gospel matters. And, and, and lest we think that we are... <clears throat> just think about how the church works today. Now, there, uh, let me use, for example, denominations in the church. Uh, there's good reasons for why there are denominations. But it's not actually a good thing there's denominations. There's, like, so there's good reasons why they exist, but it's not good that there are denominations. We should be one in Christ Jesus. There are denominations because there's different interpretations of how to read scripture and how to practice certain things. But sometimes we fall in that trap of first identifying, for instance, in our church body as Lutherans. We follow Martin Luther. Well, no, we don't actually follow Martin Luther. We follow Christ. And yes, our... our uh, And our interpretation of scripture is impacted by Luther, but we are following Christ. Same thing with the Baptist church. They are not Baptists. They are first and foremost followers of Christ. And because we live in a sinful world, a broken world, there are different interpretations of certain things. There are different church bodies that arise. But I'm not a Lutheran, first and foremost. I, I wouldn't even say I'm a Lutheran overall. I mean, I am a Lutheran since I go to a Lutheran church, and I, I'm a pastor in a Lutheran church, but I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I'm not a follower of Luther. I'm a follower of Christ. And that should be the same for all of us. Uh, doesn't mean there's all of a sudden these divisions are going to go away until Christ, they won't until Christ returns, but it should reframe how we think of, of, of who we are following. Or even think about dynamic preachers today. Uh, I mean, are there people in our congregation who basically would say, well, I follow Zardy because he said this, or I follow Hinks because he said this, or I liked him. Well, no, the pastor doesn't matter. You don't follow me. You don't follow John Zardy. You don't follow Fred Lamell. You follow Christ. And we all should be preaching Christ crucified. And that's what St. Paul is getting at here. This church is divided over so many really silly things, and they're missing the biggest point is that, it's not about Apollos, it's not about Cephas, it's not about Paul, it's not about the differences in their style, it's not about the differences in their teaching, because at this point their teachings weren't different. It is about who they are serving and who is being proclaimed, and that is Christ Jesus. And that's why St. Paul, he doesn't minimize baptism here, he's not saying that we shouldn't baptize, he just says, I'm glad I didn't baptize a lot of you, so you can't claim you were baptized in my name. I don't care if I baptized you or not. I was You were not being baptized in my name. But I'm glad I didn't baptize most of you so no one keep, so very few of you can even make that ridiculous claim. Okay? And then he also says in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So uh, Paul, and this is important for us to understand, Paul actually, his role was, main role was not baptism. Paul really did not do a lot of baptizing. He was an evangelist and a church planner, and there were other people in the church who did baptisms. So this is not minimizing baptism. It's just saying that that wasn't necessarily Paul's primary concern or call. That was a concern, pri that was a primary concern for the church, but there were other people in the church who had that gift, 
had that role. But I also love the end of verse 17, even when he writes, uh, uh, but I, I went to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Uh, like I said, probably was not that great of a speaker. He was a wonderful intellect and a great writer, but not a dynamic speaker. Uh, but the ministry is not anchored on how good of a speaker Paul is. It's an anchored in the power of the gospel. And the gospel of Jesus Christ stands on its own. It is not tied to the skills or the talents of the preacher. Uh, and, and so that is what Paul is reminding the people here. So Paul first starts by anchoring the people in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He then goes and talks about the divisions that are coming into the church based off of who is following who. And then he gets to um, what true wisdom is. And this is what we're going to wrap up today, verses 18 through 25. The word of cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discerning of the, dis and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. For those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This is really just a powerful thing here. The word of God is, the, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but it is to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Destroy the wisdom of the wise, and, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. It is really a true statement that salvation could be found in death. That life could be found in death. It is a foolish statement in, in, in the view of the world. It is a foolish statement to uh, think that somehow uh, God can become man. That a dead man can rise. These things are foolish. You ask anyone in the world, you ask a lot of people today, they don't believe in Jesus Christ because it's fantastical, it's foolish, it's ridiculous, it's a fairy tale. But it's the foolishness of the cross that is the wisdom of God. The foolishness of the cross that God would actually take on flesh and become a man. The foolishness of the cross that God would actually die and that through death he would conquer death. That is the wisdom of God. And that is what brings life and salvation. And St. Paul continues on there from verses 20 and following. And he says, where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. And basically, those who are wise in this world don't believe in God. They, they don't see God. And if you think about that again, just in the world that we live in, how many people who are some of the most brilliant people in the world, some of these, uh, some, some, some of these scientists who just look and see the majesty and miracle of life, creation, and, and all the intricate details of everything. And they look at that and they say, well, the best thing that explains that is chance and happenstance. God reveals himself, his wisdom, his power. In, in his creation, and yet people look at that, and they don't see God there. And so God said, it's not in the wisdom of man through which people believe, but it is through folly. It is through God becoming man and dying on the cross. And he says, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. Those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Uh, preach Christ crucified. And signs. People demand wisdom. People demand a good argument. The cross of Christ is for those who are in Christ, who receive the Holy Spirit, it is very life itself. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men. But the weakness of God is stronger than men. That's a really good thing for us to remember. Uh, the foolishness of God is wiser than anything in this world, and we can turn to our God who even the weakness of him is greater than any strength that is present in this world. So I know we're in the middle of this section here, but that is where we're going to stop for tonight. Um, I hope you'll join me next week as we look at the rest of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 
as well. But uh, I've really enjoyed starting off this study. I hope you will join me. And I hope if you find this uh, interesting in any way, shape, or form, that you invite people to come and, and watch this with you or even watch it at a later time as well. Uh, let's go ahead and close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for sending your son to this world. And Jesus, we thank you that you you took on the cross, scorning and shame, that you that you did something that the world would consider foolish to bring about salvation. God, thank you for the life that we have in you, that we are anchored in our faith in you. And we pray that we would not be a church that lives in the wisdom of this world, but in the foolishness of God. We pray that we would be a church that lives in unity together, not arguing over who we are following. Be with your church here in this place and our Savior and Excelsior. Be with your church throughout the world that we may grow in unity together and love for you. We pray this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining me tonight. I hope you have a very blessed week, and I look forward to joining you again next week.